I'm Dan Sweet. I'm with HAI, I'm Director of Public Relations and Communications, and we're grateful that you joined us today. We do have a, an interesting topic. We'd like to tell you how HAI and our industry partners, our industry uh, professionals are working on your behalf uh, and behalf of the industry right now. We have a great group of speakers uh, to join us today. We'll start with Jim Viola, of course, the president and CEO of HAI. We have Juliet Page, who is the chair of the safety working group here at HAI. She is also a subject matter expert at the Volpe National Transportation Systems Center, uh, which is a part of the US Department of Transportation. We have Michael Benton, who is the chair of the Flight Operations Working Group and several subgroups, which I believe he will discuss or Jim will discuss. He is also the managing director of iClimb Consulting. And we have Terry Palmer, who we welcome back. She is the chair of the Training Working Group and Terry, I apologize, you've got a typo on your name, uh, Pilot Landing LLC. Each of our speakers today do, did provide a handout, did to provide their presentation as a handout. Um, those are located in the handout tab in your control panel. Um, I know especially Juliet's is, uh, has some QR codes with links to it, and so those will be particularly helpful. For those people who are watching the video of this uh, after the fact, uh, please go to the HAI website. Our webinar page will have the links for the handouts as well. Speaking of which, we uh, will be recording, we are recording this video or recording this webinar. The video will be available tomorrow. Um, usually it takes about 24 hours for it to render and get posted. <laughs> We do ask that you ask uh, questions. We invite you to ask questions. There is a question control uh, panel in your control panel. All you need to do is click on that. It opens up a dialog box, submit your question, and we will try to answer your question towards the end of the webinar after each of the presentations have taken place. I'd now like to introduce Jim Viola, our president and CEO of HAI, to join us for the introduction. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, appreciate it. Again. Uh, Welcome everyone and thanks for uh, giving us some of your Thursday afternoon during these uh, odd times of COVID 2020. But today we've got uh, three great volunteers from industry that are on the working groups that uh, we have. I want to talk about, you know, there's been a little evolution of those uh, working groups. They used to be called committees and the reason that they kind of went from uh, committees to working groups is the working group purpose, uh, the board looked at and the, and the working groups that the board forms are to solve issues that are coming from industry and that need to be solved. So if there's a gap out there and that we need to help you as an association, we want to make sure that that's addressed and the way to address that is a working group. And then with that working group, it'll be a collaboration as to identifying what the problem statement is that needs to be solved for industry. And then the, uh, the working groups now will come up with SMART goals that, uh, that can actually be, um, so we can make sure that we track and not only do, do we just you know meet once a year at Heli Expo, and a cert certainly now, as everybody knows, we're not meeting at all over this year, but, but we certainly have taken, just as we are today with a webinar, the Zoom calls and Zoom meetings so that we can work towards those goals with a timeline, because uh, realistically, if there's something we can't solve in two years, then, then it's a pretty big problem. So. We want to have things that we don't just meet and continually talk about, but actually set some good goals and make sure that the the newly formed and we have some uh, sub uh, working groups now, and uh, you'll hear about from Michael, that uh, that have some specific tasks that we can uh, that are measurable that we can get done, uh, so that industry continue to evolve, especially with the newer stuff with the AAM and Uber Elevate and, and some of the infrastructure. And of course, um, you know, Terry as well, and some of the uh, things that she'll talk about today. But the reason that we have these working groups is because HAI, while we're an association to try to help in the health industry, and we do the, you know, HAI Heli Expo every year, we need these working groups with the connection to what's actually going on out there in industry. And these three people today that not only volunteered to lead these working groups, but they've also volunteered to come on board today and, and, and tell you about them. And if you're, there's something out there that interests you, please, by all means, reach out to us and get involved with trying to solve those issues for not only your company, but for all of industry. 
and particularly looking for more international involvement as well. So thank you very much for being here today. And let's turn it over to uh, first one today is going to be Juliet. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm Juliet Page. I am uh, chair of the Fly Neighborly Environmental Working Group. I think there was a typo on an earlier slide, uh, but no matter. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we've been up to over the course of this year and what our upcoming plans are. So um, the Fly Neighborly Training Program was initiated by HAI uh, back in the late 70s, or early 80s. Um, it's always been guided by the Fly Neighborly Environmental Working Groups, and there have been a few name changes over the years. It's a voluntary noise reduction program for pilots and operators. Um, there were guidelines developed, um, and we're in, uh, embarking on a uh, process of continual improvement, uh, bringing in, uh, revamping the training, um, bringing the latest science and research. Um, there's been a, a lot of um, really cool science going on the last decade or so. So there's a number of partners that have been supporting the Fly Neighborly Training Program. Obviously, HAI has been supporting it, um, but the Federal Aviation Administration, NASA, uh, Volpe, my organization, and a number of private and uh, public entities have also helped with the development of the science and the research and distilling it down to the format that uh, we can help spread information to operators and pilots. So uh, the core of the Fly Neighborly program is training. So we've had a number of classes uh, live at Heli Expo over the years, um, and hopefully uh, we will be also in 2021. And we also have a series of online training courses um, through the HAI Online Academy, through the FA Wings program. And the FA Wings program, um, you can get uh, points to maintain your pilot proficiency and currency uh, for taking the Fly Neighborly training. And um, well, back when we used to get together in person, we would hold uh, uh, regional events. So we would attend regional events and hold training classes and hold periodic webinars. So our SMART goal for the working group is to bring the new helicopter acoustics research and findings into the training program. I think that's a pretty straightforward goal, and that is uh, the main thrust of our, of our group. Um, we also have a second SMART goal that we are working on, which is um, developing guidance um, and preparing um, things uh, for the new urban air mobility, advanced air mobility, whatever the right uh, word is these days. Um, trying to collect together a bunch of the guidance that's out there that from Rotorcraft or other sources that could be applicable um, for this new evolving um, transportation mode. So that's sort of a uh, behind the scenes, a little heavy in the science right now, keeping tabs and trying to pull together information that will be useful from the community noise perspective. So I'm going to focus um, much of my talk today on uh, the let's see hit one too many um, fly neighborly classes. As I mentioned, we um, did have a whole bunch of classes at Heli Expo earlier this year. Um, we have enough data that we're developing specific technical guidance for nine helicopter models now, and those are all listed on the left. Um, and there are potentially some additional uh, flight tests coming up. Um, we'll we'll see how the the planning goes with COVID. Um, so we, we're hoping to expand the list of specific helicopters. Um, so we also have uh, approved for Heli Expo 2021 nine 30-minute class slots, which will be helicopter specific as well. We'll be covering those nine there. So whether um, yeah, we'll, we'll see we'll see what how the plans firm up for Heli Expo, but we are planning on um, nine classes. So. Um, uh, this is just a quick screenshot. I'm not going to brief it, but this is sort of the crux of the noise that we uh, noise information we were showing at Heli Expo in 2020. It's what we call an operational noise plot. This is for the Robinson R44, and basically allows you to quickly visualize. Hey, if you're at the flight speed and descent rate that's red, you're going to be making a lot of noise in the community. And alternatively, if you're flying at a descent rate and flight speed that's you know yellow or white or a lighter color, then you're going to be making less noise into the community. So the training program is sort of built around this. And this data was um, gathered through joint NASA FAA flight tests. And we, like I say, we have this now for um, nine helicopters. And that, that's sort of the crux of the current Fly Neighborly training. 
So um, a big part of our uh, impetus over the year is to try to make sure people are aware of the fly neighborly training and try to have as many pilots and operators uh, go through the training so that they can get some practical guidance and information so that when you know when you all are out there flying your helicopters and you know you've got your information about uh, where you need to go or vectors from from the air traffic control you can be making smart decisions with some awareness of you know where are your critical noise sensitive receptors and, and hopefully fly in such a manner that you can reduce the impact on the communities so example on the screen is just a couple of the you know advertising marketing whatever you want to call it information that we try to get out there to help spread the word about fly neighborly so that it can be more readily adopted we have a bunch of resources uh, that we've developed um, we have our fly neighborly tips flyer that is downloadable from our website um, uh, there's a rollout banner that we bring to um, events and regional events and classes. Um, we have it at Heli Expo. Uh, we distribute these materials in hard copies. The uh, Fly Neighborly Tips flyer, I've had a bunch of people tell me they um, print out a large uh, poster sized version of them and have them on the door heading out to the hangar, like a last minute reminder um, for pilots. Uh, somebody also told me they Put them on the inside of the stalls in the bathroom I'm like well, whatever it takes <laughs> if it helps spread the word we're, we're for it um so this is the link to our website on the rotor.org on the hai website um uh, we have the qr codes the top one will take you directly there the bottom one will take you to the faa wings training um there's also links to the on hai online um academy the auditory techniques modules this is like a second class um in fly neighborly um, we have links to our YouTube channel. There's a number of noise abatement and acoustic videos out there. A lot of this information um, can be useful when you're communicating with your um, uh, people in your community, homeowner associations, uh, the neighborhoods, uh, the community in the area where you operate. We try to keep it current and add um, new material as it's available and, and is reviewed. Um, so, the um, HAI Academy has the basic fly neighborly training. Um, and last year, we developed a new auditory techniques module. Um, it was FA funded, and Volpe and EBDEA Acoustics developed it together. Um, we used our 2017 and 2019 joint uh, NASA FA helicopter flight test data from, uh, we, we conducted tests at Eglin and Amity uh, Army Depot and Coil Field. Um, so we're in the process of coordinating to have that also go into the FA Wings program. Um, so that's that's in process. So the auditory techniques class is essentially a uh, it will tr allow you to train your ears from the community perspective to hear what the helicopter sounds are like, the BVI noise and such, and it will allow you um, to go out into the community and listen to your helicopters as they're coming in, approaching, or taking off. You can go to the noise critical um, uh, areas and then you can have the pilot next next operation coming in have them fly at a slightly different flight path angle or flight speed you know within the confines of safety of course um, and you can hear what the difference is and you can tailor and fine-tune your regular operations so it's a very media rich class uh, there's lots of auditory stuff to listen to lots of recordings from our flight test data where you can actually hear what the sounds are like from the ground-based perspective which is quite different from what you might hear when you're in the cockpit so moving on, we have a resource list. Again, this is all on our website. I want to call your attention to the very bottom uh, item. It's an iFly Quiet Community Engagement Guide and a resource list. We have a document um, that, has, uh, that, that Volpe put together under FAA funding. It's been all approved for public release. It has a lot of resources and tips and techniques and information to kind of hold your hand to be proactive and engage the community. There is also a uh, downloadable um, PDF or PowerPoint that you can use and other materials you can use. So if you, you know, want to have information on your social media site or you have to give a presentation at a homeowners association or a public meeting, um, we have all this information. It's been scientifically vetted, it's been approved. So you don't have to create this stuff from scratch. You can pick and choose and use what you'd like. So we're trying to pro provide the resources to the 
the operators out there so that you can be proactive with community engagement and hopefully um, avoid um, the, the noise, any noise situations escalating. Um, it's, it, we've heard a lot of information where if you just go out and talk to the community and tell them what you're doing to, to hear their concerns and trying to eliminate or uh, minimize some of the problems that you're creating, just building up that trust goes a long way. Um, at the present, we are developing a refinement of the operational noise that includes higher granularity, the left, center, right, so that if, for example, you have noise sensitive areas on the right side of the helicopter as you're approaching, but the left side is an industrial area. How can you tailor your operations so that you're putting more of the noise where you can and, and reducing it even further where you have the sensitive receptor? So we're going through the, the, the science and math and the physics of that right now and uh, preparing, a, um, preparing the right center left operational noise training. We hope to have a webinar sometime later this fall, early winter, and then we will be training, um, holding those classes live at Heli Expo in 2021. So let me move on to the next one. Oh, I think that was my last page. So at this point, thank you. Um, I guess um, I will introduce uh, Michael Benton. He is with the Flight Operations Working Group. And I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Juliet. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so uh, like Jim introduced, uh, you know, I'm here to talk about the Flight Operations Working Group, talk a little bit about the membership. Um, a lot of times I get that question as you know, who, can, who can be a part of this. Uh, talk about some of the goals that we're going to uh, pursue over the next year, and then also talk about the future. Um, and you'll see there's also going to be a bit of a heavy uh, push from the kind of recruiting perspective. Um, that's one of the goals that we have is to diversify the membership of that Flight Operations Working Group. Uh, so on the slide there, you should see this is our current membership that we have. And as you can see, it's a good cross section of operators, OEMs. Uh, we do have a new member that's part of the insurance industry, and then several consulting companies. Uh, we're, we're proud of the membership that we have, and you know, for most of the people here viewing this, I'm sure if you look at that list, you'll recognize at least some of those names. Uh, but it's a great group of people. But we're always looking for additional membership to diversify and expand a little bit. Um, and you know, without uh, the help of our liaisons on the board and the staff side of the house, it looks like the slide I have a little bit of a typo there, but um, give me one second. Yeah, so Chris Martino, you can see there, he's a HAI staff member. He's our working group staff liaison. And uh, Mark there from Ready and Air Service is our board liaison. And just for the viewers that may not be familiar with how these work, uh, these liaisons serve as really our um, connection with HAI. Uh, you know, the working groups do serve at the desire of HAI, and um, basically our guidance comes from those people. Uh, and I do want to give a special thanks before we move on to both Randy Rolls and Jeff Smith, who have been board liaisons um, with this working group since I've been a part of it. So the goals, uh, you know, our, our groups that we have, we create goals that are based on input from variety of sources. So those, those goals obviously can come from the membership within the working group. Uh, they can come from members of HAI. I mean, we do serve for membership for the HAI members. Uh, of course, the board of directors and regulators. You'll see when we start to discuss our three smart goals that some of those have been driven from industry and some come, you know, at the request of maybe the FAA. Uh, you know, Jim alluded to the smart format of goals. That's just a way that we standardize the goals and, and, and uh, plans for the working group uh, so they can be presented to the board of directors for approval. And again, the purpose there is that the working group spends its time on the things that HAI has a desire and the ability to support in the future. So our first approved goal for the Flight Operations Working Group. Um, so really we identified, you know, a lot of people in the helicopter industry feel like there's a lack of, of highly qualified or enough highly qualified helicopter inspectors at the FAA. If you look at some of the recent accident investigations, uh, that comes up as kind of an underlying tone and you know again that, that shortage has some type of impact but as a working group we decided to conduct a survey of the members of HAI to see how that actually impacts the helicopter operators and collect some data in the hopes that it can be fixed. Um, that's something that you should watch out for. I would suspect that that survey will eventually come out via something like the HAI Rotor Daily 
So if you're not subscribed to that, make sure you do and keep an eye out for that survey. Um, and you know, the I in HAI is the international piece. And there's an important, important aspect there that we're not just looking at staffing here in the United States with the FAA, but we're hoping to get feedback from some of our international members to go more towards that international focus that Jim mentioned. Um, the status of that is currently ongoing, so watch for that uh, here towards the end of the year. Our second goal uh, is really, it's, it's completed initially, uh, but we're continuing to seek opportunities. And what it was is we wanted to increase the knowledge of the urban air mobility piece for the members of the actual flight operations working group. The reason for this, as we all know, it's coming, there's no way to avoid it. it it's it's gotta be integrated into the decisions that we make today. So as a piece of this, one of our members that we recruited, uh, Luke, from originally from Uber and now with Joby Aviation, uh, conducted some overall training about UAM, UAS, and uh, trying to get, again, a better experience level there. Um, and I'd like to give one more plug again, if we have urban air mobility experts who are interested in being part of this working group, please reach out uh, because that's gonna be an ongoing task and goal. And then our third approved goal for now is measuring the needs for future technology and enhanced vision. So this is one I alluded to with the engagement from the FAA. So the FAA technology branch has reached out and they'd like to somewhat piggyback on another survey that we intend to conduct of HAI membership. Uh, and the intent here is, you know, there is talk in, of future technology, enhanced vision systems coming to the helicopter industry and integrating in flight operations. But how that information is used is something the FAA is interested in. And the reason why is because if operators are interested in getting actual credit and doing things like reducing minimums, that type of thing, uh, then their research dollars may go a different direction than if the intent from operators is just to use this as a situational awareness tool. So as part of this goal, again, it's a survey that will be coming out to membership. Uh, we just want to hear from, from you, the members of HAI, on how you would intend to use something like this, or even if it's something you're interested in. Uh, so subworking groups, this was alluded to by Jim uh, in the beginning. Um, as you know, when the, when the switch was made from committees to working groups, they also created the concept of a subworking group. So the idea with a subworking group is that it's less restricted as far as the membership goes, the meeting requirements, all of that infrastructure that goes around a normal working group meeting or uh, the administration of that group is basically removed and the working group leadership, in my case, myself and my vice chairman, would make decisions with the sub working group leaders on how to structure it. What this does is it allows us to build specialized working groups for specific purposes that can focus on that area and not be burdened by things like uh, limiting membership to HAI members. So we currently have two sub-working groups. Um, many of you are familiar with the uh, former Heliport Committee. Uh, that is now a sub-working group um, under flight operations, and it has been renamed to the Vertical Flight Infrastructure sub-working group in order to bring in more than just the helicopter side. You can see right there in my second bullet that membership is mostly consultants uh, with some operator representation, um, and they do at this point meet quarterly and again they'll meet in person at Kelly Expo. So I encourage you to come by for that meeting if you're in the area and that's something you're interested in. And then uh, in newer news, a second subworking group was just formed this month, the insurance subgroup. Uh, it's headed by Kevin Kavark with the USAIG. And at the direction of the board of directors, uh, we created the subworking group because again, operators are feeling the pressure and the strain from the increase in insurance premiums for the helicopter industry um, over the last years and particularly this year. So at this point, we decided this membership is made up entirely of people from the insurance marketplace, so both underwriters and brokers. And there are some operators and consultants that have been identified as advisors to the subgroup. Uh, they currently plan to meet quarterly and as well as the Heli Expo. So again, just like the other one, if you have a particular interest or expertise in the insurance field, please reach out. Here are a couple of the goals and initiatives for the subworking groups. So you can see vertical flight infrastructure, they're doing a, some research in a white paper on the effects of helideck and rooftop separation, as well as a review and providing feedback of the heliport design advisory circular. Um, in, in their last quarterly meeting, they have expressed a desire to 
further increase that collaboration with the UAM as well. And on the insurance side, again, it's a new sub working group, so it's just getting started. But we've identified the membership, we've established the guidelines for that group. And really, the most exciting piece of that subgroup is that they're preparing for a follow on panel discussion at Hellady Expo. So if you were in the HAI at work uh, briefing, I'd say probably two or three weeks ago at least, it was about the insurance and maintaining insurability in this challenging marketplace. So they plan on having some of those members along with a few additional people present in a, a panel type discussion to address questions. So be sure to watch for that. Uh, the future of the subworking groups and the working group, really collaboration. You know, the board has directed much more synergy. Uh, in the past, these working groups often worked independently. So now we're looking for ways that we cross paths. Again, for me, uh, trying to recruit and expand and diversify the membership. So please contact me. Um, I have my contact information here on the last slide. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, as recently as this morning, I was contacted by a air medical operations person in Canada that's seeking to join. So sounds like interest is spreading. We do have a vacant secretary position. So that's there if you're, if you're a motivated individual and want to be part of it. And again, just seeking any kind of new input and goals from HEI members, please let us know if there's something you feel like the flight operations working group should pursue. I'll just leave that slide there for a minute. It has my contact information if you're interested in joining. And um, you can find that in the download section after this presentation. So uh, with that, I do want to introduce somebody whose name is synonymous with training. That's Terry Palmer. Uh, you should see her there on the screen. And I'll just turn it over to you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think that's my middle name is training. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I am thrilled to be here with you again. Um, I don't know if I can move the, the presentation on. I'm here. Okay. here I'll take care of it for you. Thank you. So hello, everybody. Um, the training working group is an awesome group. Um, the board of directors had asked us to um asked all the working groups to meet on a quarterly basis and i said oh wow our training working groups already meeting on a monthly basis so we meet monthly uh via zoom and it's pretty exciting um our group is really exciting it had originally started out as a flight training committee um we changed that several years ago to a training committee and now it is the training working group um, we took the flight out of it because we wanted it to be training not just for pilots but also for mechanics and any other thing that needed to be trained within our industry and so we've developed several ideas and i'm going to share that with you but first i want to show you the awesome volunteers that are part of our working group so um, I am the chair, Scott Bouton is the vice chair, and Jessica Parker is the secretary. We make up the team that sets the goals and puts everything together, and we have an awesome group of volunteers. And I really want to stress that when you're working with a working group, you are a volunteer, but your, your, your information and your knowledge and your dedication is, is a very uh, is very important to us and we really appreciate anything that you do as part of these working groups. Um, HAI definitely appreciates it and we know that everybody is a volunteer and that the work they do is is very much um, prized by, by the organization. So uh, Captain Mike Becker is one of our um, contributors. He is a member, he's an our international member um, and he has helped really lead some of our processes in coming up with inadvertent IMC information. And I'm gonna share that with you in just a minute. But we're real excited that we have international um, members in our team. So we've got Mike Becker, who is in Australia, and then we've got Matt Prisnell, who is in Finland with Copter Safety. So we've got the European contingent, we've got the Australian contingent, and we'll be adding some more international because training is worldwide, it is the key to safety, it is the key to keeping this industry going. So we're very excited about that. So here are all of the other uh, members of the committee that you can see. Um, and then underneath there, I put their companies. What are these, these companies are the companies 
that are supporting the members as part of this working group. And, and they deserve the credit as well. And I'm really pleased that they are part of this. Um, it says Becker Aviation, it should be Becker Helicopter Services. Um, and um, uh, Colorado Heliops, Copter Safety, Hillsboro, and the, and the different uh, schools, every one of them, we say thank you because you are supporting the training working group members to get things done. So I'm very, very pleased that these uh, companies are part of this and that these members and every single one of them works hard. Um, we are open to new members. If you decide that training is also your middle name and that you wanna be a part of this, we would love to have you because this is the key and we help set the standard. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna share with you our exciting 20 uh, 21 projects. I'm not going to call it the 2020 projects because 2020 is not a great year. So the 2020 21 projects. Uh, first of all, we looked at the series of accidents, and this is really serious. The series of accidents that have happened um, when transitioning into IMC conditions. This has been very, very critical for us in the industry, and the, seri the series of accidents has been terrible. So we started looking at what can we do on a training basis to help this. So um, uh, Mike Becker and Scott Bouton led the, the uh, subgroup on this to develop, first of all, the best practice definition of VMC. And once that was developed, come up with a new best practice for VFR. In other words, not getting up in the air and saying, I promise I'm clear of clouds. You know, seriously, what is the definition and what will work on a global basis? So they've come out with uh, the definition and the best practices for VFR and VMC. This information will be available shortly and will be handed out at Heli Expo in the safety zone it will be um, a certain area within Heli Expo where you can get great safety information. So that was the first step. The second step was to take training seriously as far as inadvertent IMC. So basically, when you're looking at weather and saying, you know what, it's VFR, I can go. I am a VFR pilot and a VFR operation, I can go. If it's marginal, then you're making that decision. Is it going to stay VFR? Can I stay VFR? If I can't stay VFR, do I have a transition plan to get into IFR? Do I have a transition plan to return? What is my plan if I inadvertently hit instrument conditions? So um, we are developing training programs for inadvertent IMC. They are going to cover um, uh, simulator training, you know, training scenarios in a simulator for inadvertent IMC, training scenarios in an aircraft using view limiting devices, tra training scenarios in an aircraft. There is going to be online training that HAI is going to offer its members, online training that will cover, you know, what are the best practices, best procedures with, when getting into inadvertent IMC. And then the last class that we're gonna come up with, that's in the other category, that's gonna be a class that's going to be for the customer, for the executive, for the celebrity that hires a helicopter and says, you know, um, I, I need to go. I don't care what the weather is, I need to go. This is going to be a class to teach them that the pilot makes the final decision and not to put that pressure on there because that could be deadly. So that's, those are the courses that we're going to come up with. In the same time, we're working with the safety working group. Now, um, as, as we've been saying earlier, the, the working groups are collaborating together on certain subjects. Safety is actually very interested in this inadvertent IMC portion of it as well. So they are developing a video uh, 56 seconds to live, and that's going to be available at Hilly Expo as well. 
and we are collaborating with them on that project. So we have the video coming out, the courses coming out, the best practices coming out, and everything just to help with um, with this issue that was brought to us as a key issue for the industry. On the other side, we're actually looking at maintenance training and maintenance training outreach. And I realize the photograph is covering where it says training outreach. But we were looking at maintenance, the maintenance side, not just the pilot side, looking at maintenance and saying, what training resources do we need in this industry? And there was not a lot of data to tell us what was needed. So we started participating in ongoing maintenance uh, training programs or maintenance seminars that were out there and asking that question, what resources do you need? Because HAI has this great ability to develop and post training materials on the website so that you can go to HAI as a member and have all this training resources available to you. And we just needed to know, what is it that maintenance needs? So the first training safety symposium was held um, a month ago, and um, Airbus was kind enough to, to host that. And we went in there as the training working group and the tech working group to say, hey, what kind of training resources do you need? I know you're looking at all this material that you know is being presented today, but come back and tell HAI what training resources do you need? And we will help you find them. So that's one of the things that we're looking at. So if you're in the maintenance side of the business out there and you, you know what training resources are lacking, please reach out to us and let us know because we are looking to find those resources for you. And I can tell you, uh, for the most part, they came back and told us it was technology issues um, because you know they know how to or they might have gone to factory school for the aircraft specific, or um, you know they know how to do the the basic maintenance on a on a helicopter. But all this new technology that's coming out has been a, a little bit of a challenge. So we're looking at ways to help, you know, build that um, technology resource for training. So that's the other part of it. Now we do have other smart goals that we're working on uh, that we will be developing later on. These are the ones that are most important to us right now. And based on what our membership in our working group has, this is what we've been able to work on. Next slide, please. So what are we going to do at Heli Expo? So I'm hoping everybody comes to Heli Expo because we have exciting things happening. In addition to the, the annual rotor safety challenges that are going on every year, uh, well, there's there's pre-conference courses and then there's tech briefings, but there's also rotor safety challenge courses that are amazing. And there's so much good material that you can get at any of those. Um, and of course, um, the safety working group will be having the safety zone uh, and they'll have all kinds of handouts and different information, especially on the our new video and our new uh, VFR VMC best practice. All that will be available there. But we are also, as a training working group, we are going to have a training town hall meeting. This will be a two hour meeting where we're going to introduce the products we've already come up with um, and, and our SMART goals, what we're already working on. So we're gonna introduce the inadvertent IMC courses and we're gonna introduce what we're doing on the maintenance side and what the status is on that. But we're going to ask you, what training resources are you looking for? What are your training challenges? And how can HAI as a training working group help you? How can we help you meet your training goals? So those are the things that we're gonna be looking at at Heli Expo, and it's gonna be very exciting. And the course structure that is set up now, and I, I believe that it's already set up for this coming year, it's incredible. So I, you will definitely be seeing a lot of good material at these training courses. New working group members are welcome. If you are want to be a part of it, if your company wants to participate in, in getting training done or taking it to the next level, we're very interested in that. We're very interested in including our UAS members 
and and those in that sector. So we are collaborating right now with the other working groups, safety, flight ops, tech, and UAS. And we're open to any ideas that you have because training is the key to safety and training is the key to success. So uh, next slide. So I would like to ask anybody that wants to reach out, reach out to me. There's my contact information. Reach out to Greg Brown. He is our staff liaison for the training working group. We love to have you. We're a very active group and we're getting things done because it works for you. Thank you. I'd like to invite everybody back onto the cameras again so we can answer questions. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Juliet. Thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, first of all, I apologize for some of the technical issues. Um, some of the slide formatting decided it just wanted to fight today. I do apologize uh, to Michael for mispronouncing the uh, name of his company, uh, VY Climb. And uh, Juliet, I can't begin to explain how I ended up uh, substituting safety for fly neighborly. I, I knew exactly which group you were on. Uh, Don't worry about it. <laughs> been one of those weeks, I guess, or one of those years. Uh, do want to start before we get to the questions uh, to remind people that if you do want to join a working group, we're always looking for people. Go to our website, rotor.org, look under the About uh, tab at the top, the menu section, and then go to the working groups. And there actually is an application in there um, for you to join any one of the 12 working groups we have. Uh, we do have some questions. Um, I'm going to throw this first one out for everybody. Um, what was it and we'll start with let's go let's go in the order we started juliet uh what was it that made you want to join some of the hai working groups or working committees back uh, when they were when they were committees so um my training is an acoustical engineer and i've been doing a lot of research on noise and helicopter noise modeling and measurements and kind of living in the science geek land and want to take that information and get it into the hands of operators so that it can be used. I mean, it, there, there's no benefit to having reside in some you know, technical journal when there's this great information that can be used to improve you know, noise relations with communities and reduce the noise. And you, know, you just have to fly the helicopter a little differently and you can make a big impact. So that was my motivation. Oh, I appreciate that, Michael. What about you? What made you decide you wanted to join? Uh, it was about the same time that I left working for an operator and kind of struck out on my own. And at that point, you know, you have those thoughts of you feel like you could make a bigger impact or, or have, uh, you know, make more positive change in some way. And rather than just talking about it, I decided to join the working group. I joined it when I was back in the committee uh, with, I think, Scott Tisch was the leader back at that point. And um, when he stepped down, it, I decided to go ahead and try to become a chair. And here I am. So. And Terry, Terry, what brought you into uh, the realm of training with uh, the working groups with HAI? Well, I've been with HAI working groups for more than 15 years, so now you know I'm an old lady. But um, I have been doing this for a long time, and I started out with the safety working group. And um, But my career has always been in training. So I, when I realized what we needed as far as training and how training was such a key to safety, um, I became a part of the the training committee back then and which eventually became the training work group and made it tried to make as many changes and bring training uh to the new level that we've got now okay um we've got a couple of questions that look like they would be individual so i'm going to just kind of jump around a little bit uh, michael let's how often do the working groups meet uh, so we met quarterly uh, the last couple of years um, in fact, the board of directors just recently directed that uh, all working groups must meet at least quarterly. Uh, but there are some, I believe, Terry's group, you meet monthly. Mm -hmm. um, Fly Neighborly, what, quarterly on that one as well? Yeah, we, we quarterly, but we have monthly for some of the sub-working group um, activities, yeah. which isn't the whole committee. Yeah, and I say that's, you know, more for the formal meeting where we keep agendas and minutes. Uh, but there's, you know, there's back kind of behind the scenes collaboration and communication takes place all the time. Okay, um, and let's go to Juliet for this one. How does, uh, and I think this was addressed a little bit during the meeting or during the webinar, uh, how do the working groups choose the projects they are working on? And go ahead. 
Yeah, so it's sort of a collaborative um, process between the members of the working group and a lot of your interest, this is a volunteer working group, is driven by the skill set and interest of the, of the working group members. Um, but we also, you know, have to think about the HAI vision and goals. And um, all of the working groups have a staff liaison and a board liaison, and they also provide some input. Um, as, as you may pointed out earlier, we now have the SMART goals process. And uh, we have to kind of think about what we're going to do over the next two years and have, you know, achievable milestones. And we have to present that to HAI board and have them approved. So it's, um, it, and there's some refinement that goes on along the way. Um, and so it's, it's sort of a collaborative, iterative to a degree process. And it's driven by the membership of the working groups as well. So if uh, you are working in one area and as you're processing the uh, results out of that, if something else comes up or becomes obvious, you can uh, start working to uh, work with the board uh, to discuss that new topic perhaps? Yeah, or it may suggest a natural collaboration with some of the other working groups. So Fly Neighborly is a training program, so there's clearly some synergies with the training working group. Um, but we also have some synergies, for example, with the TORS uh, working group. And uh, noise uh, from TOR operations is a thing. And so we are also um, looking at elements of that um, to see if we can, uh, in the future, uh, develop some uh, fly neighborly training targeting those areas. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's a very organic process. Okay. Uh, Terry, let's go with you. The next one. Um, how are you governed with the uh, the working groups? Are there documents uh, that uh, you need to abide by, or uh, what can you tell me about that? Yes, yes. Um, the HAI and the board has developed terms of reference, which are our guidelines for our our a working group, and so we we are very formal in the sense that. Uh, there's meeting uh, minutes kept. The agendas go out in advance for official meetings that we're going to be voting on, um, and how many members, how how they get elected to the the board. Everybody that's elected to our working group is um, is brought in on an individual basis. They have to come up with a a letter that says their company is going to support them to do this and that they want to do this and and why they want to do this and then they're elected to the working group we've never turned anyone away <laughs> um but we do go through the the exact process that's embedded you know process that's necessary and we do follow the rules we report um, to the board well to follow along with that are there terms for the working group members or the uh, the officers the chairs yes Yes, there are terms, and the, the terms are listed in the terms of reference. They're usually two years, and then if you want to stay on, you can automatically stay on in, in for a second term, and then after that, it has to go to the board for approval if you want to stay on longer than that. And my name has been up there since I've been on here 15 years. So, <laughs> And we appreciate it. Um, Michael, how does the training working group, uh, hold on, you've already got that one, I've already got that one addressed, I apologize. What is the process for participating in the training working group? If somebody wanted to join your group, what would they need to do? Um, was that for Terry then, uh, training working I group? Apologize, just, Terry. <laughs> Actually, I apologize, Terry. Actually, it said operations and I said uh, training, I do apologize, that is yeah. for you. Yeah, so for flight operations, so again, uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, how does somebody, what does somebody need to do to, to join your, one of your, either your training group or your subgroups? Uh, what do they need to, you know, how kind of an industry experience do they need or, or what? Right. Now that's a good question. Um, and, and really the, the challenge we have right now is that our membership, a lot of the members kind of have, it brings very similar experience. And that's one of the reasons we're trying to diversify a bit. Um, we're, we're heavily represented already in air medical. Um, like I said, you know, that's why I'm excited to have somebody joining us internationally, potentially. Um, but like Terry mentioned, I think Danny might have hinted at it, you know, you can go to the website and, and research a bit there. Uh, really, the easiest way is just to reach out directly to any of us. Um, let us know what your skill set is, and, you know, maybe you're better suited to another working group that you're not aware of. There are 12, I believe, right now. Um, and then typically, uh, like she said, the process is, you know, you have to have support from your organization. 
uh, we typically get a copy of your resume. Um, again, it's it's it is focused on people that are experienced in the industry. Uh, but one of the things I've been trying to do in the flight operations working group is not you know try not to limit it to the people that have the 30 and 40 years in the industry. Um, I'm actually been tapping into a, a fresher or younger crowd, and I can say that now since I am a grandparent myself. Uh, but a, but a younger crowd of people. Um, because I want to get some of those fresh perspectives. And what I've found is a lot of times those people who are really kind of right at that cusp where they're starting to really start to be recognized in the industry, um, they're a little more motivated, more humbled to be there, and more energetic and happy to, to do the extra work. Because it's definitely not something you want to do just to, say, pad a resume. Um, it's definitely something where there's work to be done. Uh, so we're looking for people that are excited about it. So. Oh, that's good to hear. I mean, I, I, I love the fact that there's so much experience on the, uh, the working groups, but the fact that you're open to the new perspectives, new ideas, fresh ideas. Um, I mean, we have a very evolving uh, industry. And so uh, it seems like uh, having new blood would be a great idea. Yeah. If I can add on to that with this Certainly. whole advanced air mobility, urban air mobility, emergent field transportation mode, I mean, that naturally is going to bring in a new cast of, of folks with expertise and experience and, and, you know, backing and interest. You know, we've, we've been lucky in Fly Neighborly Committee. We have um, a couple of people in that area that are um, involved uh, that are helping with our SMART goal, too. But it's always a challenge to, to reach out and draw people in, especially for volunteer positions. Um, but, you know, we've always got our eye open for people with new and fresh ideas, so. Well, and uh, one of our newest working groups is the Unmanned uh, Aircraft Systems Working Group. Uh, and so that uh, seems like there's a lot of potential there. Um, we do have 12 different groups, and so there's gonna be something where everybody will have an interest. Juliet, we have one that's actually a little bit uh, technical for you. Are there any efforts to improve the ways that public service agencies have their overhead announcements via helicopters actually being clearly heard from their loudspeakers. I imagine you're competing with rotor noise uh, when you're trying to make a public service announcement from a helicopter. Yeah, that's an intriguing question. I am not aware of work going on, but that's not to say it isn't. I just haven't come across it. I think from, a, um, from an acoustics perspective, you're dealing with two different spectral contents. You know, the, the oral speech is you know, probably a couple hundred hertz to a couple thousand hertz, where where you're going to want to hear that and it to be recognizable. The helicopter rotor craft fundamental frequency for a conventional helicopter tends to be much lower. So you've got these two different different frequency spectrums that are going to propagate differently and be absorbed by the atmosphere differently. So there's um yeah, that's that's an intriguing problem. I hadn't really I haven't really thought about it. That, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they actually had follow-up. Are there any standards for PA announcements or would a higher pitched voice and clear speaking style um, assist in competing with uh, the aircraft operational sound? So somebody's putting a lot of thought into this. There probably are some standards out there off the top of my head. I can't rattle off the numbers though because <laughs> I haven't really done work in PA systems. Uh, contact me offline. We can see what we can find out. Sounds like you get a new member. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Awesome. Uh, actually, I, I kind of like this one for all three of you as well, but let's start with Terry. What has one been, been one of your most difficult challenges in leading your working group? Um, one of the most difficult challenges is getting everybody together for a meeting since we're covering so many time zones. I mean, we've got Australia and we've got Finland and then we've got uh, people in the United States in all of the time zones, including Alaska. So uh, that's been our biggest challenge. Um, uh, but everybody has has met that challenge by um, coming up with ways to work on Microsoft Teams, which um, HAI has made available to us, and also through our Dropbox. And so we've been able to to combat that. But that was the hardest part: is corralling everybody. <laughs> uh, have you? We'll follow up. I want to. I'll come back on to you on that one, uh, Michael. What about you? What have, What's been one of your biggest challenges? I think mine might be a little different. Um, when I took over the working group and leadership role, um, it, it, 
it was somewhat stagnant at that point. And this is, not, I mean, it's not a hit on you know previous leadership or anything like that. But I think across the board, there was maybe some confusion about how the committees at the time were used by the HAI board. So I think getting past that was was great. I know with Jim's leadership, we've seen positive change with the, you know the, the title and structure change, and the fact that the board is much more engaged now. Um, so I think getting and keeping new interests um, when I first took over was probably the biggest challenge. And Julia, what about for you? Well, I'll echo the time zone one because we've got Australia, France, Hawaii, and all the U.S. zones. But um, in addition to that. My my thing is not taking on too much. And what we do take on, make sure we do it well and follow it through. There tend to be way more ideas than hours in the day to get it done. So it becomes a prioritization. And then that becomes, well, how do you prioritize what's most important? And you know, so that for me, um, leading the Fly Neighborly Working Group, that's kind of been a challenge is to prioritize and, and pick what we can realistically get done with you know the hours in the day that we have. Well, as one of the follow-up questions, and for, uh, let's start with Juliet and uh, Terry, who kind of alluded to it to begin with. It seems like now with the social distancing, the technology for distance meetings has really expanded, such as we're doing with the webinar now. Um, has the technology made it easier for your groups to meet? Uh, Victoria, uh, Juliet first, please. Um, yeah, I, I think it has. I mean, you don't have to meet in person. I've been remote duty employee for five years, so hey, welcome to my world, right? <laughs> Everybody's up to speed on the tech now. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think I think having the, you know, you can quickly hold a webinar, you know, with less advance notice than having to schedule an in-person meeting and travel and hotels and all of that. It gives you a lot more opportunities that you didn't have before. And now, you know, by definition, the whole world is endorsing this because we have no other choice. I think that will um, enable a lot more new and unique things to happen in the future. You know, we have to adapt to this format, but you know, once you've done that, hey, the world's the oyster. Let's go do it. Uh, Terry, same question. I mean, is is something like this allowing, uh, and and then from Michael as well, is something like this allowing for um, a greater uh, bringing in more people from around the world, uh, allowing people to to join your working groups. Participation has been a lot better now. We were doing conference calls monthly prior to, um, you know, everything coming on to a, a, a webinar or Zoom. And uh, so when we started adding that to it, we actually were able to expand our, our group a little bit more because uh, we had that ability uh, because some of these are uh, work better internationally than just a conference call line. And then also, the just being able to see each other and and share the experiences and just see someone's expression on their faces no that's not what we're going to do you know <laughs> let's do it this way uh, and that's helped a lot too michael how about for your groups yeah absolutely um, like you said it's a lot smaller commitment you know to give up a couple hours once a quarter than to try to travel someplace in person um, I think HEI was a little ahead of the curve too, because I believe it was before COVID or, or BC that uh, they actually started to allow remote voting via email, um, where before we you know, kind of had to do it in person uh, once a year at Heli Expo. So yeah, they, they were ahead of the curve on that one, but it's definitely been helpful. Uh, okay, we've only got time for a couple more questions, but actually you mentioned something about a meeting at Heli Expo. If you join a working group, uh, does HAI cover the expenses for you to get to the uh, Heli Expo, or is this something that uh, you try to work with an employer to maybe contribute? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that was for me. HAI doesn't cover, unless I'm the only one that's not getting paid for that. But no, uh, <laughs> HAI does. They, my understanding is, uh, you know, as a speaker, I usually get um, free admission to the Heli Expo's full pass. And I think as a uh, chairman, possibly, of a group, a chair leadership in a working group, you do get access but those expenses again if you're with an operator um, oftentimes that's what that support is that letter of support from your operator is saying things like they'll help cover your expenses and and that's their commitment to help contribute i don't know terry or julia if you have a different experience well that's why i put the names of those companies on on my slide along with their the participants in the group because those are the companies that pay to get to get uh, their own people to participate 
have supported us by doing that. And, you know, we've only met once a year at Heli Expo for our face-to-face. -face. We were going to meet um, in, in the summer. Uh, if, if we hadn't shut everything down, we were going to meet face-to-face -face one other time. But these companies have agreed to support that kind of a, a participation. And I think that's critical. Yeah, my, my experience has been the same. HI has been supportive of the Fly Neighborly Working Group and, and has provided us with a booth at the um, Expo Center. So, you know, we've had that to be able to do outreach uh, to the HI membership um, in, you know, classrooms and all of that. HI has provided that, but, you know, the, the, the time and effort to physically get there, we're, we're on our own. Okay, um, let's uh, finish with one of the questions we routinely ask uh, everybody. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. What is the single most important message that you would want our viewers to take away from the webinar, um, either personally or related to your working group? And let's start with uh, Michael on this one. Um, I think uh, for me, and this is not just the working group, but the industry and, and safety as a broader picture is, you know, if, if you're if you're just talking about it, it's not really enough. Uh, you need to get involved, get involved with HAI, get involved with the working groups, um, get out there, put yourself out there, speak, you know, be, be a part of these, these great webinars, these things that, you know, Terry's group has been putting on, um, get involved. It takes action for sure. Terry, how about you? Training makes a difference. You can make a difference. And HAI wants to hear from you. And that's the most important thing. HAI wants to know what resources do you need so that we know what we're going to work on. But you can make a difference. And Juliet. Yeah, I'll echo all of that. And, um, you know, the the individual operator and helicopter pilot really does make a difference when it comes to community noise and flying neighborly and um you know there we're, we're trying to provide all resources and training to help you with smart decision making smart and safe decision making so reach out to us and let us know um what what you need and how we can help and how we can tailor it better well, I need to express my gratitude to each of the three of you, Terry, Michael, and Juliet. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for so much for uh, being a part of the working groups and uh, uh, all the leadership involved uh, in running these groups. Um, you make it sound like there's only a couple of hours a quarter, but I know that there's significantly more time that a person can dedicate to the issues you're working on. And so we are grateful for each of you and the uh, members of your team. Uh, for helping out not only HAI, but uh, helping out the industry as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, please go ahead and uh, turn your cameras off. I, uh, I need to uh, address a few housekeeping issues before we finish up today. Thank you so much. Uh, coming up next, save the date. Uh, next week we have part two, Finding Success Careers as a Rotorcraft Pilot. Uh, this is for the low time pilots who are, or brand new pilots who are thinking about uh, getting into the industry. If you have interest in certain uh, mission areas, uh, we have three new pilots who will be coming in to talk about the work uh, their company does and how you can uh, apply a skill set to get to uh, work for them. On November 12th, uh, the day after Veterans Day here in the United States, we have a Mill to Civ uh, workshop. Uh, it's it's not as elaborate as the one we have at Heli Expo, but uh, we have some very dedicated people who will be coming in to help discuss the transition from working in the military to the civilian world. As a reminder, on December 10th, we have FAA Administrator Steve Dixon. Uh, all of our webinars are at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Right now it says uh, uh, universal time code minus four. Actually, that will shift over the weekend here in the United States to UTC minus five. Um, I forgot to mention that on the, uh, the slide. If you have questions, watch for the uh, information for our webinars in email, through social media, and in Rotor Daily. We will have a questionnaire coming shortly. We do ask that you spend just a few minutes uh, responding to our questionnaire. We'd like to know what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and if you have topics that you'd like us to address on these webinars. More broadly, please let HAI know what we're doing well or wrong as an organization. 
Uh, let us know what we can do to help the industry. Best way to do that is to contact Jim Viola at president at rotor.org with your suggestions, your challenges, your praise. Uh, we take it all. Jim sees every email and he passes it along to the staff. We do thank you for your time today. We will see you next week. Until then, fly safe, be safe, and we'll see you next week.